okay, shove to be a giant ches. He poly mid chodover. Rashi explains what it means a kipole. A pele in Hebrew is a wonder, meaning you're in wonderment. You, you have, there's a lack of clarity. Rashi says something which is concealed from you. If something is concealed from you, whether it's regarding judgment, Rashi explains to determine blood. There's certain blood which is menstrual blood and other blood which is not menstrual blood. The Gemara tells us in Nido that the five views of red which are considered menstrual blood and if it's not within that range although it's blood the woman is not contaminated. In the time of Rabbi Lesben Hurkinus who is one of the Rabbeim of Rabbi Akiva this expertise to discern between between these four five views and other other shades of red were, were forgotten. Okay, so being dumb the dumb, but in time of the Sanhedrin, or time of Moshe Rabbeinu, they were able to. The people who had that expertise to make that discernment. Being din le din, whether a person's guilty or innocent. Being nega le nega. Or what's considered a leprous lesion, what's not a leprous lesion? Divri Rivas Bisharecho. Or one does the rules contaminated, other rules not contaminated. Now, is the person guilty is innocent? So what do you do? The Kamta Volisa Lamoko Mashiv Hashem Lokepo. You ascend to the location which Hashem has chosen for you. You go to the Quran, the Levim, where are located in Yushalayim, and to the judge of that day, and you will delve into the question, and they will tell you, they will give you a definitive answer of what the law is. And you will do based on what they tell you. From that location, which is the Temple Mount, which God has chosen. And you must observe whatever they direct you. Based on the Torah, which they, they guide you. And the law which they tell you you should do. Now, this is the famous negative commandment about veering from the words of the rab of the Chachomim. The rabbis were empowered by the Torah to legislate rabbinic fences and were bound by a rabbinic fence on a Torah level. You're not permitted to veer from what they tell you to the right or to the left. Now, even though that, but that's actually what the Torah is saying. That there's a question what the Torah says, but it definitely says when they give you the definitive answer, you're not permitted to deviate, not to the right or to the left. So Rashi says there's a famous Chazal here. Yomin was small. I feel overlochal yomin shu small. While small shall yomin. If they tell you your right hand is your left hand and your left hand is your right hand. Definitely, if they tell you right is your right and your left is your left, you cannot deviate from what they tell you. Now, the question is this. If they tell you right hand is your left hand and vice versa, you're bound, you must accept their, their position. I mean, how can you accept their position? The sun is shining and they tell you it's dark. Right? I mean, it's, it's absurd. What does it mean? If they, even if they tell you the right, your right is your left, left, you must accept what they say. Just simple understanding. Very often, a person believes, he's convinced he's right. But if he's open-minded and he's willing to listen, he can be shown that what he believes he's right is really wrong. Because the, the Bezdin, the high court had such a level 
of clarity, they themselves, or the court in general, these people, they will have the ability to illuminate and elucidate things that people are in the dark. So what you believe is right is right or left. They tell you, no, what you believe is right is really left. And what's left is right. That we had in the Chobos uh, of we had studied at one time that a king builds a replica of his palace for his son, the prince, with all, literally, same quality, stonework, architecture, everything. And he puts sconces in the walls that you could put torches to illuminate the palace that he constructed for his son. And he tells his son, you look at this palace from the outside, it's a miniature of his father's palace. Beautiful. But without the sconces, lighting those torches in the in the palace, you can't see where you're going. But this son thought he was smart. He's able to feel his way without putting on the, the, the these these torches. He walks in, and as you walk in, there let's say there are three steps going down. He falls down the three steps. And he injures his arm. And he says to, his, to himself, what kind of palace did my father build me? He built me a, a, an edifice here. It's literally, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to survive it. He goes a little further. He hits his head into a corner. And he feels blood coming out of his, out of his skull. He, you know, a head injury. Lives, falls, little, walks a little further. Falls on his face. And they hear him screaming and writhing in pain. They come running. It's what happened? They and he's he's arrayed at his father. Look what kind of palace my father built me. So to find him, it was he was in the dark. They put on the sconces, the torches. It's illuminated, and all of a sudden you see, it's one of a kind of palace that he built. The son was a fool. If he would have put on the lights, he would have seen where he was walking. He was groping in the dark. He didn't see the steps. He didn't see the corner. And therefore, he sustained all this injury. Akash Baruch created a Torah which illuminates its Torah or it gives you an understanding of life. What you see to be negative is positive. Positive is negative. But who has that understanding? Who knows how to turn on the light, so to say? Shlomo says, the Chachomim are any home. They are the eyes of the people. And the Malbim explains why, why they the eyes of the people. When a Kurdish Baruch who created the human being, where did he locate, situate the eyes? On the highest part of the body. So because it, be, being on the highest part of the body, you're able to maximize on sight. It would be lower down. You wouldn't have the same level of, of sight. You can't see as far. The Chachomim see what, what the average person don't, doesn't see. Because of their dimension of greatness. Therefore, they are the eyes of the people. The Torah is the is the illuminator. If you have an irresolvable question, you go to them. Asherucha, if they tell your right is your left, your left is your right, of course. But if, even if they tell your right is your, your left, and vice versa, you accept their words. Because what they understand, you don't understand. It's, we're groping in the dark. In the dark, it feels like something very nice to turn on the lights. It's, 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 it's disastrous. And that's why... So it's not to tell you to do something which 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 is absurd. They're giving an understanding of what reality is. I always used to say, you know, in the 50s, if you ever you bought a container of milk, they had a picture of the American breakfast. What was the American breakfast? White bread with butter, bacon, and red meat, and whole milk. That was the American breakfast. That was the specimen of health. Fast forward so many years later, if you want to have clogged arteries, eat this processed flour, white flour, butter, the fat, cholesterol, you know, by the age of 40, you know, the person needs minimally, you know, a, a bypass. So what they understood then, they were in the dark. Later, only became, they became more advanced to understand, they understood this is disastrous. So what you thought was healthy is unhealthy. And things continue continuously change. What you think is, is not. Only with time, and even when they say it's not, it may be yes. But when Chazal tell you, or Lisa, you go to the Temple Mount, 
where that's the ultimate level of clarity, and they tell you your right is your left, and your left's right, you accept it, because what they understand, you don't understand. It's like when I started teaching Gemara many years ago with the Yad Abram people, there were a number of retorts. Rabbi, this doesn't make any sense. I said, it makes sense. With time, you'll understand. It took a while, but then they understood why this makes sense. What they didn't understand was really because they didn't understand. And that's exactly Chazal, what they understand, we don't understand. So even if they tell you right is your left and your left is your right, you should not deviate or veer from what they instruct you. The necessity for this mitzvah, that the high court of Israel has the last word, it's fundamental to Torah itself. The Torah was given in writing. It's the written law. As time goes on, many situations evolve. And people have different opinions exactly how to apply the principles to those situations. Vine yirbu machlokis, and as a result of this, people have different understandings. This is the basis for machlokis. Vitasa Torah, kamatoros. And if this is the case, we have many, in terms of we're going to have many religions. You have the Shammai religion, you have Basil religion, and you have this religion, that religion. God gave us one Torah. What did God say? Who's the, the final word and the most expert position on what the, what God said? Without Torah Shabal Peh, Torah Shabal has no value. The Tztuk and the Sadducees who rejected Torah Shabal Peh, they did not live as Jews. Even the original Sadducees were Jews. Because if the interpretation is not God's interpretation, they're doing something other than what God wants. It's like somebody says, the rabbi, you said this. I never said it. But you said those words. I may have said those words, but that's that's not what I meant. And I explained what I said. You didn't you didn't pay attention to what it was. Well, you didn't understand my explanation of what I said. God gave a very specific text. It's called Chamish Chum Torah. We have the five books. But he gave his commentary on those every word of those five books. Anything other than what he said meant, that's not what he said. So, But if everybody has another opinion what he said, we, we have a problem. Or how to apply the principles. I mentioned the other day, Ramosha Feinstein, he, had, he has a chuba on the microwave oven. If you cook with a microwave on Shabbos, is it an Isidor Is it a Torah violation when you cook with microwaves? Or is it only rabbinical? So Ramosha Feinstein shows and cites a Rashi in Shabbos, it's an Isidor Isa, Torah violation. But the question is, we know that anything which is done not as they did it in the Mishkan, because everything is derived from the building of the Mishkan, it's not, you're not a violation of the Torah law. So if that's the case, in the Mishkan, they cooked with fire. They didn't cook with, with, with radio waves, with microwaves. If that's the case, why are you in violation of cooking if you cook with microwaves? See, Saitz Rashi in Shabbos, in Kiro, the Rashi says, why if you use thermal energy, or it's a thermal energy, why are you not in violation? So he says, so Rashi says, of course, people in the Mishkan, because in the Mishkan, that's called conventional cooking. And since people don't cook with thermal energy, that's not called conventional. So he says, but what happens if society, that becomes the mode of cooking in society, and that's called, and that becomes conventional, it becomes an instant Raisa. Therefore, Moshe's ruling is that if you use a microwave on shops cooking wise, you know, violation of Bishop on a Torah level. So that's an extrapolation, understanding the principle from a Rashi, how he explains why Klachayat, why if it's not the way they did in the Mishkan, why you're not in violation on Torah level. But who has that capacity 
to b- make that extrapolation. They have to, have to, they have to have that dimension of greatness. And I always mention, you know, Alan, yeah. this, this area, medicine, the case of the Siamese twins, you know, the famous psak, which Ramosha had given, because he had, they were connected at the brain, and he had to separate them, and one of the children would, would die. Why is it permitted? Because we don't take a life to save a life. And he had written a response on this, lengthy response, and was published in the Philadelphia, which, what was it? Philadelphia paper. Inquirer. Inquirer. Philadelphia Inquirer. It was a two, two, two page spread. And it gives the whole background. How Ramosha Feinstein said that he fasted for a day and the tshuva, that Hashem should give him the clarity, he should not be distracted, he should come upon the truth. And he wrote, he wrote the responsa. Coop, who was the the uh, Surgeon General. Surgeon well, General. That, at that point, every group was the chairman of surgery at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, more specific. You sure he wasn't the professor at Wharton? Okay, just want to make sure. So he went, and when he read the, the chuba, the response and every detail of how Ramosha ruled on this, he was amazed that a man with his background in Talmud, which seems to be unrelated to modern medicine, understanding every intricacy and the sensitivity of application of Jewish law to, to, to human life, he was amazed. But it's called Shei Yerucha, because he has that, not only the knowledge, but he has the Siat and Shemai, which Ramban speaks about. They were of, of a special dimension. These people who are qualified to sit on the high court, they merit a Siat and Shemayo. And because of that divine uh, endowment of clarity, they understand differently than everybody else understands. They have the capacity to understand truth, which nobody understands truth the way they understand it. That's the Ramban. So he says, the Chotach Lono had Kosov Adin, She Nishma Lebes Nagodl, Omi Lefne Hashem, the Mokum She Yifkar, the Choma She Omolonu, the Fesha Torah. This group, they convene at a location which God had chosen. That they should elucidate and give us an understanding of the Torah. Ben Shekimlu Befei Rusho, Eidni Pied Umosh Biagvura, meaning it's the, the accurate transmission. They have the accurate transmission, which they share with us. Oh, this is it. Shiomru Kain Lefish Mashmosa Mikro O Kavanoso, or it's their understanding of the Pasuk or the connotation. Kial Dashelem Hunose Lema Torah. Hashem says initially, when I'm giving the Torah, they are the keepers of the Torah. The Sanhedrin Agdola, the high court, even the way we see it, they're telling us the left is the right, or vice versa. Why? Because the Spirit of God is on those deficients will oversee the Migdosh. Lo Yazov is Chasidov. And God will not abandon his Chasidim. Lo Olam Nishru Minatos Umina Michsho. They merit divine assistance to protect them from misunderstandings, from pitfalls. The Loshin Sifri, I feel a marin may necho aloyimin shu smo, al smo shu imin shmalahem. Even according to your understanding, they tell you to put your left shoe on your right foot, vice versa. And it seems to be not right, you listen to them. Because Hashem endows them with an understanding, and because of that endowment, they have clarity, which you don't have. But he says, because the Hasidov, he will not abandon his Hasidim, and he gives them that ability to understand, which other people cannot understand. You know, uh, an Achron, a later commentary, cannot argue with a with a Risha, with an early commentator. It's irrelevant how well you could be well versed in Shas. You could quote instantaneous from every source. You understand? You can't argue with a Ramo. You, you, your IQ could be a thousand. It doesn't make a difference. Why? Because at the level they understand. 
you don't understand why they understood the way they understood. Therefore, they being having that level of credibility of being who they were, you can't argue. I can't argue if I don't understand the basis of why they came upon that position. Therefore, an Akron cannot argue with a Rishon. A later authority can argue with it, with it from, from the earlier era. Among, even the certain Akronim. The Chovetz Chaim writes that he says that the Reb Kiva Eger was the greatest Torah sage from the time of the Vilna Gaon until this time. Nobody was as great as Reb Kiva Eger. He says Reb Kiva Eger, as great as he was, we have relevance to understand who Reb Kiva Eger was. But the Vilna Gaon, we can't even fathom the Vilna Gaon, how great he was. Therefore, to argue with the, the Vilna Gaon, you have to have a sense of that person to be able to argue because you understand the basis of his process of thinking. But the Vilna Gaon thought his position, he was like a Risha, although he lived in a later generation. We can't fathom who he was. As a result of that, you can't argue with him. It's, that's basically the understanding. So the Sanhedrin Gedola, that he says they're endowed, they, they're, they convene in the location which Hashem chose, which is the Migdosh and the Hasidov, they merit an endowment, a clarity, which is only due to that spiritual endowment. Therefore, they, they have the final word. Because they have that level of clarity, which nobody else has that level of clarity. Rebbe, aren't there 